Can we go to July 15th? Yeah. It's, it's, it's so recent that, you know, it's, it's, it's just must be terribly painful. But if, if you would just tell us what happened that day yeah. to put all of this in context. It was actually um, Sunday, July the 14th. Yeah. And um, I had been working all weekend. And um, on Sunday, it was an absolutely glorious day. My parents were having a barbecue. So I went down with the children and gave Fierke a day off because he had been minding the children all weekend. And that was, that was a regular thing. He was absolutely thrilled with himself and he went over to a local hotel and watched the games that were on and just had a little bit of time to himself. And we, were, we were in regular contact throughout the day. I didn't, I didn't suspect anything. I came home and brought the kids to bed. Fierke was still downstairs and we said goodnight and I went up to bed and then Oshin, uh, it was quite early in the evening, started to cry as he always does. He has, um, he suffers from growing pains. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, God yeah. bless him. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a regular occurrence that we have to go down and give Nurofen or massage his legs okay. and I fell asleep with him. I, I shed it down to Fierke, it's okay, I'll look after this, I'll deal with this. And he was obviously delighted, he wasn't running up the stairs to help me anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I fell asleep with Oshin. And the next morning, um, I woke up, it was probably about nine in the morning, nine, about nine, nine fifteen. And I rang Fiercra, and there was no answer. I couldn't at this stage hear a phone ringing in the house. They'd rang his mobile. I expected him to be in work, so I wasn't listening out for a mobile phone. I rang a couple of times, then I texted him, are you okay? I, I just kind of, I expect, I just thought that maybe he was down in a boiler and in a plant room and just, I'd left, left us. I didn't think anything. I just thought this was just normal. Sure. But then I went in to wake up Karis, my little two-year-old, and um, from her bedroom, which is at the front, and I rolled up the blinds and I saw Fiercra's van. And I immediately thought, oh, he's, he's after sleeping it in. Oh, my God, his boss will kill him. His boss will kill him. And I start shouting up. I said, Fierker, Fierker, you're late for work, you know. And Oshin at this stage was beside me. And thank God, I don't know, I, somebody was looking after me because I just told Oshin to stay with Karis. Not, not suspecting anything. I just said, stay with your sister. You know, it's just mine, Karis. I went up and the door was closed, and, which is very unusual in, um, in our house. We always had the door open because... The children. We, we wanted to yeah, be able to hear the children. Yeah, course, yeah. Yeah. And I pushed the door open and um, Birka was there, dead. He'd taken his life. And he had just nowhere else to go. He obviously just felt, just pushed to that. I never, ever, everybody who knew Fierkra, everybody who kn knows him and knew him, nobody, he was the last person anybody would ever expect to take his own life by suicide. He, he was the kindest, kindest person. And he loved, he loved life and he loved me. He loved everything to live for. Um, you know, the, we, it was so strange because he'd planned to go to the States with my dad, who's due to go on Monday. He'd been saving all throughout the year for that little holiday and he'd borrowed from the credit union. You know, there was absolutely no signs, nothing, nothing at all. Did something happen, Stephanie, in the week or a couple of weeks before that you think now, because you've had time to have a think back and yeah. what in God's name would bring a man to you this know, point I, in I, his I life. actually thought about it immediately. Of course you did. After, after I'd kind of come round and yeah. realised what had happened and realised that this is not a dream, it's not a nightmare, I'm, I am actually awake here. This isn't going to change. And I started to think about the week previous and we'd fill out yet again another financial statement. And I, I, as I was thinking back, I realised that Fierke was quite irrit irritated about having to do it again. Mm -hmm. And we also received a letter from our mortgage provider to say that we had accumulated 19,000 plus arrears on our moratorium. And you know the usual letter that goes with it that your home is at risk. We didn't have a home. we didn't have a home. And I noticed that when I handed this letter to Fierke, who looked after all of these, he just couldn't bring himself to open it, and he threw it into the glove box of my car. Yeah. Now looking back on it, I can say that is really unusual because he would always take them. He'd always open confront them. Confront the, the devil. Yeah. yeah. He'd deal with it. He'd say, "I'm going to ring Michael, you know, about this first thing Monday morning." And at that stage, he just. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't react normally. How are the children? They're fine, you know. Oshin went back to school last week, which is, you know, it's a first, a first, there's going to be a lot of firsts, as we said, Ryan, you know. He had his first day back in school, he's in second class. He's going to make his first communion. 
he wanted his dad there on his first day and that was the first thing he said. He said, you know, he's really excited about going back to school, but he really wished his dad was there with him. But, you know, he, he's, he's a really, really good little boy and he's clever and he's intelligent. And, you know, I, I'm so lucky to be surrounded by such wonderful family, Fiercrest family, my family, that Oshin will have a lot of really positive role models in his life. Stephanie, what do you want to happen? What do I want to happen? How can you make sense of all of this? I just can't let Fiercrest die in vain. OK. I, you know, if by me talking here tonight, can help one other person, be it from Priory Hall or from, be it anywhere, can make them reconsider taking their own life by suicide. You know, just see what's left behind. You know, there is a solution, there's an answer, there's lots of people there to talk to, you know. I, I you know, I, I don't know, I like what I want for Priory Hall, I want it to be knocked down. I, I, I could never go back there. That was the home that myself and Vicar bought. So if it is even rebuilt, it's, it's, it's not going to be the home that I loved and shared with my, my beautiful partner. Do you think that, you know, there's been a lot of talk this week with Taoiseach and Phil Hogan have been talking about Priory Hall. Do you think it's time for them to do something serious about this and, and to, to try and fix the problem? Do you think they're able to? I mean, what would you say to Andy Kenny if he was sitting beside you today? What, do you, what message would you deliver to him? First of all, they should have dealt with it two years ago. You know, then we wouldn't be in this mess. There wouldn't have been millions of taxpayers' money and most of all, we wouldn't have lost a life. Fierke would be sitting here, you know, we'd be telling you about how great Priory Hall is now that it's been rebuilt, you know, and that the Celtic Tiger had created so many monsters. Yeah. And, but this one has been laid to rest, you know, and Priory Hall is, is now, you know, a home for people. Yeah. You know, he keeps hiding behind, they keep hiding behind the, the excuse that, that it's going through the courts, but yet there, Mr Hogan was very happy to use a public platform during the week to discuss Priory Hall when he won't come and meet me or any of the other residents of Priory Hall.